Man, that's a good title. It's a damn shame it's associated with a crappy Eli Roth movie. As if the term crappy Eli Roth movie narrows anything down. Hello, I'm Larson Halleck, and welcome back to another pearl-clutching edition of Manthropology. Today, we're looking at one of the bad boys in my beloved field, a guy who has caused more delicate women to gasp and flail at their slender rib cages than Oscar Wilde and the Marx Brothers combined. That man is Michigan's own Napoleon Shagnon. I was reminded about the proper pronunciation of his name by a fan. Mr. Shagnon's legacy is not one of thumbing the eyes of PC fantasists and frauds. Well, yes it is, but it isn't just that. It's also a story of fascinating ethnography, of findings of great implications for all men and women and society on the whole, political, social, cultural, and actual warfare, and most importantly, the ability to present a people as they are found, with respect and camaraderie, but without sugarcoating and idealization. Napoleon Alfonso Chagnon was born in Port Austin, Michigan in 1938. In 1958, after a year at the Michigan College of Mining and Technology, he transferred to the University of Michigan, where he did his B.S., Master's, and Ph.D. in Anthropology by the year 1966, his Ph.D. thesis based on his fieldwork amongst the Yanomamo people of Brazil that started in 1964 and continued intermittently for the next three decades. That is what we shall be talking about today. The early 1960s were a halcyon time before the anthropology schism, when nature versus nurture was still a divisive topic, but cordially. Proponents of each were capable of debating the matter in the halls of academia, despite the fact that the heavy slant towards nurture was, of course, well underway at that time. And it was in this environment that young Napoleon went to Brazil, fully preparing to study a tribe of Sylvanists, Running about in Arcady, his hopes were quickly dashed. The Yanomama were decidedly different from what I had imagined them to be in my Rousseauian daydreams. The whole situation was depressing, and I wondered why, after entering college, I had ever decided to switch my major to anthropology from physics and engineering in the first place. I had not eaten all day, I was soaking wet from perspiration, the mosquitoes were biting me, and I was covered with snot-laden red pigment the result of a dozen or so complete examinations I had been given by as many very pushy and sweaty Yanomamo men. I pondered the wisdom of having decided to spend a year and a half with these people before I had ever known what they were like, and I am not ashamed to admit that on my first day, had there been a diplomatic way out, I would have ended my fieldwork right then and there. After having himself a good cry that night, Napoleon decided that what he had learned in school was in many ways inaccurate. So he decided to gird his loins and start researching for real. Sure, all of the theory he had learned over eight years of education... Or should I say allegedly learned, because as I was so delicately reminded, nobody teaches noble savage theories anymore, allegedly. ...had in the course of two hours been kicked in the dick. But that didn't stop our boy. While many an anthropologist of today, <coughs> or literally any other social science, would have, in the face of cognitive dissonance, gone home and then made up some story that is approved by the hatchet-faced arbiters of our culture, Napoleon Chagnon is a true scientist, principled, inquisitive, and open-minded. When faced with data that debunked his theories, Mr. Chagnon did the proper thing. He went right back to the beginning of the scientific method and started observing with the intent to make new hypotheses, experiments, and theories. In the two of his books that I own, his academic text, Yanomamo, The Fierce People, and his more general readable text, Noble Savages, My Life Amongst Two Fierce Tribes, and so forth, makes it very clear that A, he greatly admires and respects the people he has lived with for 30 years, learning their language and ways, and pointing out features of their culture he admires, and B, despite his admiration, he does not idealize them. He presents them objectively as they are. Or, to put it another way, he acknowledges that they live the way they've evolved to live, and that's best for them. Inclusion from whites, whites in the Latin American sense, is undoubtedly bad for them, and he makes that quite clear, while also making it clear that the Yanomamo cannot just magically become nice, liberal, white people, which, when you get down to it, is basically the leftist dream. Why is this the case? 
Because Napoleon Chagnon theorizes that these sorts of small-scale tribal societies are the closest analog to humanity at the dawn of civilization, societies on the cusp, perhaps, of becoming sedentary agricultural societies, thus studying them can possibly have great implications for how human society and sociobiology evolved. Chagnon summarizes his research into four findings. 1. Violence and terror are ubiquitous. Surprise! Russo gets the shit slapped out of him again. The overwhelming majority of small tribes found in their native state today live in a state of continuous raiding and low-level violence, punctuated by occasional large battles, and there is every reason to assume that prehistoric tribes lived in a similar state. 2. Maximizing security, rather than resources, is the driving force behind more complex socialization. While deep down men dream of violence and bloodshed, it quickly becomes a negative in the real world when your wife or wives and children are threatened. Thus, the formation of more complex states results in men abandoning to varying extents their violent honor cultures and submitting to authority in exchange for the state doing their fighting for them. While this has not exactly happened amongst the tribes of the Amazon, Chagnon refers to multiple cases of headmen ruling over larger populations than normal and asserting their authority to a greater extent than usual, theorizing that this may be a reasonable facsimile of the first step of the formation of states that occurred many thousands of years ago. 3. Kinship selection is the predominant factor in forming large social groups. In other words, people will be predominantly concerned with those that share some degree of genetic relation. Due to this being a form of reproductive success, namely, you share genes with your relatives, so if they have children, a percentage of your genes are being passed on. This is of variable effectiveness, but considering that, yeah, racial groups are to an extent both based in social constructs and genetics, kinship selection also extends to tribe and nation. There is also an implication that this third tenant is intertwined to the second tenant. A group of men bonded to each other through blood and honor culture. That is a military unit, and that will indeed maximize security. And four, as populations increase, the power of leadership also increases. The smallest unit of human society is essentially an extended family, and thus for obvious reasons there won't be much in the way of strong authority. When a leader has less of a concern for hurting his own family, he will assert his authority more often. Some of the Yanomamo headmen are brutal and cruel, and some are more content to play politics and avoid violence. The relevance to us in the Manosphere is not explicitly stated, but implied via anecdotal evidence. The behavior of a Yanomamo leader, i.e. the leader of a preliterate semi-agricultural tribe, shares many similarities to the behaviors that are seen in quote-unquote alpha males of politics, business, and sexuality. And he provides much evidence to substantiate these claims in his writing, and provide a great snapshot of an indigenous honor culture that has more than a few parallels to ours. For example, his discussions of the numerous types of physical contests of masculine honor are fascinating. And yes, they do do much to corroborate much of what we discuss. Namely, here is a group of people largely untouched by quote-unquote Western masculine social constructs, and it turns out that their idea of proper masculine behavior is basically similar to the same ideas of masculinity everyone else has, in a somewhat raw and unrefined state to be sure, but still recognizable. This difference largely due to how theirs is an honor culture, rather than a dignity culture that characterizes modern industrialized society, or it used to, as some writers think we've entered a victimhood culture. But that's a topic for another day. And I would like to point out that I have never once claimed that all men in all cultures are entirely the same. Just that there's more overlap than differences, and the differences certainly don't justify the loopy, gender roles aren't real stuff. I'm only giving a brief summary. You ought to read his books for yourself. They are invigorating reads. Tales of constructing huts and whitewater rafting and raiding and hunting and genuine friendship with the tribe. All the things that an ethnographer should do. But a reader of Shagnon can't help but notice something... triggering about his data. Ubiquitous violence, kinship selection, wife-stealing, killers of men get to mate more, fear and anger of cuckoldry... 
Yes, as you might expect, Shagnon's data was not received very well. In fact, based on the presented data, one might surmise that the average Swipple would run screaming out of Amazonas after spending a few hours with the tribe. Due to the tribe's culture being so antithetical to good think in 2017, Shagnon describes their fear of cuckoldry prompting them to aggress against both men and women. And I quote, Again, the most common cause of fights between men was women, approximately 40%. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but there is a very uh, vivid, shall we say, passage, which describes a husband who suspects his wife of infidelity, and he sets his wife's genitals ablaze with a torch. It's good stuff. I really shouldn't need to, but I feel I do need to explain that no, I do not condone spousal abuse. I'm just studying it as an example of how the Yanomamo are three-dimensional fears with the same flaws and foibles of us quote-unquote civilized people. And also, implicitly, to show how modern Western society is not better or worse than the Yanomamo, just different. Physical abuse versus ritualized and glorified humiliation of a spouse. And data does suggest that women do honestly prefer being abused to having a slavery and supplicating lapdog. The controversy truly began in the 1970s, which is coincidentally around the time that the field of anthropology irrevocably split. Indeed, as I've alluded to, the rational and objective scientists acted more like hysterical church ladies in reaction to Shagnon's writing, and Edward O. Wilson's as well. At the 1976 Anthropology Association of America Consortium, Edward O. Wilson was scheduled to give a lecture, Wilson being the author of Sociobiology a book whose central thesis was that evolution, particularly social and cultural behavior, could be applied to humans. Naturally, cultural anthropologists, referred to as being openly Marxist by Shagnon, protested and demanded that he be banned. Allow me to repeat that for you. These scientists were protesting the theory of evolution. Shagnon asks tongue-in-cheek, how can a group of scientists in 1976 be protesting Darwinian theory? And before anybody chimes in, yes, the controversy was primarily because cultural anthropologists felt they had a moral duty to go against the data, and they only later claimed it was inaccurate. To quote another of my uh, teachers, Robert Trivers of Rutgers, New Brunswick, for every clear demonstration of how effective a biological explanation of some phenomenon is, it must be balanced by an appeal to BS, emotions, and political correctness. Or take it from one of his opponents. What Chignon doesn't understand is that anthropology in Brazil is always a political activity. Another one. Nancy Schlepper Hughes of Berkeley says, Cultural anthropology should be naming the wrongs that have been done to the indigenes by anthropologists. Field research locations were no longer places to do research. Now there were scenes of crimes against social justice. We have to provide restitution to the victims of our research. And of course, when there are no wrongs to blame, you make them up. And okay, one more point and counterpoint. So saith Paul Gross, biologist at University of Virginia, 30 years ago, the difference between technical disagreement and moral warfare began to dissolve. A whole generation of students and teachers are convinced that everything, including science, is political, because knowledge itself is a political phenomenon. And politics are just too important to be nice. Nancy Hughes again wants a militant anthropology, a new cadre of barefoot anthropologists that must become alarmists and shock troopers, and produces a morally demanding text and images that sink through the layers of acceptance and bad faith that allow the deaths to continue. In other words, we have to make texts that make the social justice happen. I will be fair here. I don't know how Shignan acts so I don't know how much of these attacks are provoked or not, because he makes it seem like they are entirely unprovoked. On the other hand, considering how irrational social justice warriors are, and how they attack you know, the most meek and mild-mannered people, I can honestly believe that their intellectual forebears are similar. But back to the main story. Shagnon's opponents would cherry-pick data. They would outright lie, namely in claiming that Shagnon claimed that there were infanticide and warfare genes, which he never claimed, and on occasion, they would resort to physical violence, like with Edward O. Wilson, who had multiple pitchers of ice water dumped on his head at the 1976 Consortium, while the International Committee Against Racism screamed that he was an evil Nazi racist eugenicist. Oh, and at the time, Wilson was on crutches, having broken his leg in a skiing accident, so, you know, points for assaulting a cripple. None other than Margaret Mead herself tried to bring order to the Consortium, 
and in layman's terms, tell the openly Marxist cultural anthropologist to grow the hell up and treat Chignon with respect, even if they disagreed with him. Now, Mead herself may have had an ideological bent, but she was still capable of giving an ideological opponent courtesy and respect. And that is something I respect. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, Chagnon continued his fieldwork while trying to drown out the increasingly loud caterwauling of cultural anthropologists and occasionally fighting his colleagues, general leftist rabble-rousers, and the Catholic Church within Brazil, who would incidentally sometimes work together to keep him out for various reasons. The Celestian mission being the de facto administrators of the Yanomamo territory, were also heavily implied to want to move villagers around for purposes of converting more of them and thus raising their own status within the church hierarchy. Furthermore, Shinnan does a bit of conspiracy theorizing about all of this being intertwined with interest in commercial manioc farming and mining, which, to be fair, I find slightly less plausible. You know, but still, social justice working together with big business? That seems oddly familiar to anyone with eyes. In the early 2000s, the book Darkness in El Dorado was published, in which claims are made that Shagnon killed Indians to test racial theories, Shagnon deliberately gave tribesmen measles, and of course, a prissy allusion is made to Nazism with the quote, a heart of darkness beyond the imagining of Joseph Conrad, but perhaps not Joseph Mengele. This, combined with several hit pieces in anthropology magazines and a constant deluge of hate mail and phone calls, led Napoleon to have a cardiac episode and then quit field work. Things look up. It turns out that literally all of Shagnon's data was accurate when looked at objectively, and most of the accusations in darkness were repudiated. Patrick Tierney, who wrote that darkness book, was proven to be a typical social justice twat who talks a lot but accomplishes nothing other than slander and effeminate body language. Says a representative of the Yanomamo tribe, Mr. Tierney's book has been translated, and we are annoyed with his lies. When he was in the Orinoco River Delta, he promised medical aid and hospitals. We have none of these. They accuse Neil, Brewer, Roche, and Chagnon of manipulating us, when they were the only ones that helped us. Chagnon's Noble Savages book was received in 2012 with mostly rave reviews. Even the Huffington Post gave it a good review in a stunning display of tone deafness. Of course, there were a few critics of the book, and they look exactly like you would expect them to look. And that brings us to today, where Shagnon is no longer an untouchable in the anthropology community, and yet not a single person who slandered him has ever been punished. This is why I do this show, so that a great scientist does not have to be slandered and driven to hospitalization ever again, and that the lying, sanctimonious, hypocritical do-gooders may, you know, just one time, suffer for their actions. In other words, to force them to have skin in the game. But that's a whole topic I can do a video on by itself. I'm Larson Halleck, and... I would like to address a critic of my first Manthropology episode. One Jason Colavito, whose website is linked below, and he's all in all a pretty intellectually hefty guy. He was not a fan of my show, claiming that while I do have a quote-unquote grain of truth in my arguments. My criticisms are largely founded on an antiquated idea of cultural anthropology, and they are not valid based on what's going on in the field today. Furthermore, he claims that I am even more of an ideological paladin than the cultural anthropologist I criticize, and that I am afraid of knowledge itself, because knowledge would prove that my conservative views are not in fact universal as I claim, and, you know, my thinking is just a hop, skip, and a jumping away from open, imperialist justification. In the spirit of respect and an open mind, I wish to address and counter-argue. First of all, I want to make something very clear. I despise imperialism, and I have no desire to return to the scientific racism of the 19th century, which I explicitly made clear in the first video by criticizing Francis Galton. Unlike your average leftist, I am capable of seeing people of color as three-dimensional human beings guilty of the same foibles and desires a white person is. Which is, you might admit, a little bit unusual for a white supremacist. Oh, and by the way, I'm a person of color myself. Beyond the moral reasons for being against imperialism, I'm against it for a very practical reason, that of imperial backwash, to borrow a concept from John Updike. If you imperialize now, 
Your descendants will be dealt a guilt complex, and your former imperial subjects will team to enter your borders. Filled with a delightful cocktail of idealization of your fabled riches, and, perhaps justifiably, seething resentment of the former oppressor. So I say it's better not to imperialize at all, to avoid all of that. You know, incidentally, I'm not the only person who has noticed how nice, liberal, white people have an utterly patronizing view of people of color. Just ask John Dolan, who, being a writer for Matt Tybee's The Exile, not exactly a conservative. Although I will admit he is a better writer than me. And frankly, I wasn't always right-wing either. I was far to the left in my youth before being turned off leftism because, well, because of the hypocrisy that I criticize in my videos and my website. The schism exists, and there's no denying that. I cite some pretty big examples of it in the video you just watched, extending beyond the 1900 to 1940 time frame that you claim I think anthropology is stuck in. Ignoring the field of anthropology strictly, just look at the omnipresent denunciations of Charles Murray, who for the record I'm fully aware is not an anthropologist. When people practically burn him in effigy for mentioning that IQ might have some amount of basis in nature, which is the subject of exactly one chapter of the bell curve, that seems to me to be an example of the ubiquity of leftist cultural anthropology. And to your credit, you do agree with me in the notion that in the popular imagination, we are still reacting against the Victorians. My argument is merely that academia is more in that mindset than they'd like to think. While those protesting Charles Murray have likely never read a cultural relativist anthropology text, <coughs> or the bell curve either, the idea of something that's racist but not actually racist, being anathema to me, seems to be the logical conclusion of intersectionality and critical theory. Now, perhaps there is a gray area between sociology and blank studies and cultural anthropology, but I see a lot more overlap than division. Oh, and as a side note, pretty much everything the Belker predicted came true. Perhaps the field has changed. I question that, considering how much of an uphill battle it was for Keeley and Chagnon to publish, and how harpending still getting shat on from beyond the grave. Whether or not it has changed, the pop cultural impact upon Joe Punchclot is still largely the hippy-dippy chicanery. Napoleon Chagnon being welcomed back into the fold may in fact be a sign that the field of anthropology has truly evolved and become more tolerant of bad think. And thus, you might be right about that. Although, I would point out that none of the people that trashed and slandered Chagnon over the last three decades were ever fired or lost so much as a penny for their transgression. And I will admit that the original title of that article and video was a bit clickbaity and sensationalistic. A better title would have been something along the lines of The pop cultural impact of anthropology has been heavily slanted leftward, and thus created many sociological problems when dealing with intercultural and racial relations. I think we're all happy now. I'm Larson Halleck, and I appreciate humanity in all of its splendor.